Genesis chapter 30 verse 25 to Genesis 31 verse 21, tackling the tension of living in two worlds. It's lovely to be with you this morning at St Anne's Limehouse. It's a real joy to be filling in for my good friend Richard Bray. Our episode this morning in the life of Jacob is a truly intriguing one. So let me pray and then we will dive straight in. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you are with us, that you are for us and that you are sovereign over us. Thank you for our wor- your word and our time together in it this morning. Of all the things that we need today, our greatest need is to hear you speak to us. So Father God, please allow us to sit at your feet and listen to you. Please take this your word, make it alive by your spirit and show us your son, our Lord Jesus, more clearly. We pray this in his beautiful, conquering and precious name. Amen. It is exhausting living a double life. And let's be clear, we all lead double lives. The public life of respectability and the private life of chaos and conflict. The Sunday life or your working life where you go out and you convince everyone that you have got it all sorted. And then the Monday to Saturday behind the scenes life where you run around frantic and fraught just trying to get through. A life where we're asked by people, how are you? And we all lie through our teeth and say, I'm fine. Then behind the scenes, back in our houses, when nobody's watching, all the tension that has been building erupts and we explode in a way that shows we are anything but fine. It is the tension of living in two worlds. We have our life of faith where we are pursuing Jesus enjoying God's presence, a life full of hope and joy. And then we have life in this fallen world, a world full of strife and stress and sin. And we live in the tension between the two. And yet tackling this tension of living in two worlds is something that Jacob, the main character you have been tracking with over the last few weeks, is very aware of. As you have seen, Jacob is a bit of a scumbag. He is a twister, a cheat, and someone who is very good at looking out for number one. Yet despite these major character flaws, he is someone to whom our gracious God has been very, very kind. Back in chapter 28, in a dream, God applies the blessings given to Jacob's grandfather Abraham directly to him, promises that Jacob must wait to be fulfilled in the future while he deals with the consequences of sin in the present. It is the real tension of living in two worlds, the world of promise, a world waiting to be fulfilled, and his world of consequences, dysfunction and disappointment. A world of hope, a world of despair. He lives between the two. We join our story in chapter 30, verse 25. And I want us to see this first scene as faith in the future. Faith in the future. We join Jacob reaping the consequences of sin. He is in Haran, the place he fled for his life, having cheated his older brother Esau out of his inheritance. He is still with his uncle Laban, who has exploited him now for nearly 20 years. The first 14 years were in payment for his two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Even though Jacob only wanted to marry Rachel, Laban cheated Jacob and did the sneaky switcheroo on their wedding day. And so in verse 25, we read, Rachel gave birth to Joseph. This is Jacob's 12th child by four different women. Joseph is Jacob's 11th son. He also has one daughter. His sin sent him to Haran. The sin of others have kept him in Haran. And the sinful dysfunction of his own family has escalated into a dozen children and five parents within his household. Yet Jacob 
knows that his life will not ultimately be defined by the mess that he is in, but by the promises that God has made. That is great hope for people conscious of the tension of living in two worlds. Our life will not ultimately be defined by the mess you experience now, but by the promises God has made being fulfilled in the future. And so Jacob knows that he needs to leave Haran. He knows that he needs to go home. So he says to Laban, send me on my way that I can go back to my homeland. Laban, however, isn't ready to give up his golden goose. Jacob has made Laban incredibly prosperous. And Laban knows it. In verse 27, he says, the Lord has blessed me because of you. Or in verse 30, Jacob says, the little you had before I came has increased greatly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. So Laban doesn't want to let Jacob go. And Jacob is eager to secure a big payout to set him up for when he finally arrives home. This is where Jacob comes up with a cunning plan. He says to Laban that he will continue to tend Laban's flocks on the provider so that he gets to keep the speckled and spotted sheep, the dark lambs and the spotted and speckled goats. Basically, if any of the livestock are multicoloured, they belong to Jacob. If they are standard white or monotone, they are Laban's. In essence, Jacob is opening a futures market on multicoloured livestock. However, Laban the cheat seeks to thwart this plan. So in verse 35, Laban removed all the multicoloured livestock and put them in the care of his sons and ensured that there was a three-day journey between the main flock and this multicoloured flock that Laban had separated. A three-day journey would curb the advances of even the most amorous sheep towards the multicoloured flock. However, Jacob enacts another cunning plan. He makes the sheep look at striped things or spotted things in the hope that they might produce multicoloured offspring. This kind of thinking was prevalent right up until fairly recently. Pregnant women thought that if they focused on beautiful things, they would have attractive children. My mum, unfortunately, had a very short attention span. However, I think despite all the hocus pocus, we are supposed to see this as a miraculous intervention by God continuing to bless and prosper Jacob, ready for his return to his native land. Not only does this plan produce more multicoloured livestock, Jacob also ensures that the multicoloured ones are the strong ones. He gets the strong flocks and the weak monotone ones that will belong to Laban they're to be weak and puny see verses 41 and 42 the conclusion of the whole experiment is summed up in verse 43 in this way the man Jacob grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys I take it he traded some of his sheep for the servants, camels and donkeys, rather than show the sheep pictures of camels and donkeys while they were pregnant in order to get them to give birth to different species. See, though, Jacob has a forward-facing faith. He has faith in the future. He knows that Haran is not his home. And for God's blessing to be fully realised, he needs to journey back. God has blessed him every step of the way, prospering and protecting him despite the deceit of others. Hebrews 11 verses 8 to 10 helps us understand the dynamics of this passage. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says this, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, 
even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he slash they were looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. It is this exact point. They made their home in the promised land knowing that God will deliver on his promises. This is why Jacob needs, knows that he needs to go home. Despite the mess of life in the fallen world and all the patriarchs' new dysfunction and mess, they all clung to the promises of God and knew that is where their true hope was found. I guess here is the object lesson for us. Like them, we suffer the tension of living in two worlds. And yet, like them, the way we tackle the tension is by clinging to the promises of God. These promises now more vivid and even more concrete through the Lord Jesus. Not just hope in a future, but looking back to a cross, looking back to Jesus' death and glorious resurrection, these promises are concrete. This is great news for you as you sit in your house this morning. To know that there is more than this. To know that beyond this great city of London there is a true home, a perfect city whose architect and builder is God. A city where we will dwell and we will have citizenship in through the Lord Jesus. We like Jacob must have a forward facing faith. We must have faith in the future for this is our hope that we might live with and amidst the consequences of sin now. We do so as those forgiven and redeemed and on a journey to a place where the penalty, power and presence of sin will be no more. A place where the promises of God are fully realised. This is how to tackle the tension of living in two worlds, have faith in a future where everything will be different. Let's turn to chapter 31 now. Let me read chapter 31 for us. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude towards him was not what it had been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come out to the fields where his flock were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude towards me is not what it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I've worked for your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However... God has not allowed him to harm me. If he said the speckled ones will be your wages, then all the flocks gave birth to speckled young. And if he said the streaked ones will be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked young. So God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to me. In the breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw that the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled or spotted. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled or spotted. For I have seen all that the Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Then Le Le Rachel and Leah replied, do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children. So do whatever God has told you. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels and he drove all his livestock ahead of him along with all the goods he had accumulated in Padan Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Jacob had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. 
Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all he had, crossed the river Euphrates, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. Our second scene is presence in the present. Presence in the presence. Present. As we begin chapter 31, some time has now passed. And Jacob's prospering has come to the attention of Laban's sons. And so they complain. Not only is there complaining, but Laban starts to give Jacob the cold shoulder. Both these signs are supplemented by God telling Jacob that it is time to return. Jacob calls for Rachel and Leah to come to him and tells them that it is time to make their escape. Verse 14, his two wives are totally on board with the escape plan. And so verse 19, when Laban goes out to shear his sheep, Rachel steals their household gods and they make a run for it. Laban, who had deceived Jacob all these years, is then the one deceived by Jacob. Verse 20, moreover, Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean by not telling him he was running away. See, though, Jacob knew the protection and presence of God throughout these enti this entire time in Haran. God has been with him these two decades, even amidst all the chaos. Look with me at these verses. Verse 5. I see that your father's attitude towards me is not what it was before, but the God, my father, the God of my father has been with me. Or verse 7, your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. Or verse 9, God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to me. Or verse 13, for I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you, says God. I am the God of Bethel. Now leave this land and go back to your native land. You see, here is the second way to tackle the tension of living in two worlds, to know that even in the mess, the chaos and the brokenness of this world while you wait for all God's promises to be fulfilled, God is with you. God is protecting and preserving you. God is on your side. He is helping you and caring for you. God sees it all, knows it all, loves you through it all and is sovereign over it all. Though there is pain, fear, disappointment and distress in this world while we wait, we must remember we are not abandoned, we are never forsaken, we're not left just to get on with it. Jacob's God is our God and he has relinquished none of his care, none of his power, none of his love, none of his control. And we must know that none of his plans can ever be thwarted. Therefore, we have great hope and great help, even as we wait. God is with us. Are those not the words of the Lord Jesus before he leaves this world of mass to make preparations for the world of the future? Matthew 25, 8. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So friends, it is exhausting living a double life, a life in this fallen, messed up world and a life made new by Jesus that we will be fully realised in the future. However, the key to tackling the tension between the two is to know these two things. Live your life with faith in the future. Know that if you trust and are trusting in the Lord, the mess, mistakes and mania of your present life will not ultimately define you. Jesus will. Know also that as you wait, endure and persevere with the life of faith in this present world amidst mess and chaos. Know that the God of the universe and his ever conquering and ever compassionate son, Jesus Christ, are with you. They are for you and they are eternally committed to you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that in Jesus we have sure and certain hope. Thank you that this hope will one day be realised and all the brokenness will be fixed, all sin will be gone, 
all despair will be banished and all heartache will be healed. Till that day, Lord, keep us trusting in, loving and hoping in your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs>